Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, this is the Shenango Forward Phase 4 Reopening Webinar. Uh, my name is Carrie Green. I'm the President and CEO of Commerce Shenango, and I thank you for joining us for uh, the fourth of this type of webinar. We've been holding webinars over the last few months um, for issues facing Shenango County and the Southern Tier. Just as a reminder, today's presentation is being recorded and we, we will be sharing it online. In addition, please keep your microphone muted throughout the presentation so background noise isn't distracting uh, from the messages our speakers have for all of you. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and get started. Real quick, I just introduced you to myself. Um, on the line also with us today, we have Matt Beckwith. He's the Director of Emergency Management uh, with the Shenango County Bureau of Fire. Marcus Flint is the Public Health Director with Shenango County Department of Public Health. And we also have Isaiah Sutton. He is the Director of Environmental Health. And together we will be providing you information you need regarding phase four and recent developments from the state related to COVID-19. Also today, I'm pleased to feature Jessica Moquin. She is the Executive Director of the Shenango County Historical Society and Museum. And she'll be providing us with some information a little bit later in the presentation. First, I'd like to introduce Shane Butler, and my apologies, Shane, I didn't throw your face up there, but um, I asked Shane to be on the presentation really briefly to talk to you about the 2020 census. Shane, do you wanna give an update? Sure, so as of right now, only about 52.8% of Shenango County residents have filled out their 2020 survey. Um, that's kind of low right now, so we're hoping that people can, as you talk to your family, friends, employees, whoever you may come in contact with, remind them to fill out your 2020 census survey. You know, especially during coronavirus, it's gonna be helpful in the next 10 years for funding, for grants, for our health departments, fire departments, um, everybody basically, you know, economic developers. So whenever you can encourage people to fill out their census, um, they can go to my2020census.gov, which is on the slide on the bottom. And I'll also post that website on the chat too. Okay, thank you, Shane. Yes, it's very important. Um, to fill out the 2020 census. We want to make sure that Shenango County has a voice and is heard. And as Shane noted, you can see some points on the screen of what census data is used for, all really critical to the future of Shenango County. So thank you very much. Uh, real quick, I just want to review with you uh, the reopening guidelines. So we're talking today specifically about phase four and other um, areas that have been opened up the last week. Um, the state is divided up into regions and we sit in the southern tier here in Shenango County. There are seven metrics that the governor's office was looking for before deciding if we move from phase one, two, three, and four. Um, this is monitored by the regional control room and then it's reviewed by the governor and he has a separate team that looks at that data to decide if we're able to move to the next phase. Um, and I serve on the regional control room as a proxy to Chairman Wilcox, um, and I communicate this information daily with um, our Director of Public Health and Emergency Services, as well as the Chairman. So yesterday, the Governor had one of his daily briefings, it had been a few days, but he did go on and announce that we had met all of the metrics required here in the Southern Tier to move into Phase 4 this Friday, so that's tomorrow. June 26, um, the Shenango County and the Southern Tier will move to the next phase. So what does that mean? What is in phase four? Um, it's really actually neat to see all these boxes with check marks and now we're at phase four. I remember when we were at phase fun at one, it didn't seem like that long ago. Phase four includes arts, entertainment and recreation, um, higher education, media production, and low risk indoor and outdoor arts and entertainment are all part of phase four. Um, so on today with us, we have Marcus Flint and Isaiah Sutton, and I believe Marcus is going to handle these next set of slides. He's going to take us through what each of these um, sectors within Phase 4 include. Marcus? Yeah, thank you, Carrie. It's uh, certainly nice to be with all of you today. Um, I'm going to make uh, comments on the slides, but I'm not going to actually read them uh, word for word. So uh, as the slides come up, uh, please go ahead and, and read them. So uh, as Carrie mentioned, uh, phase four opening uh, includes higher education. Uh, the second check mark uh, you'll see there uh, lists uh, what is included. Um, these organizations, uh, just like the businesses in opening of phase one, two, and three, uh, will have to submit a, a plan uh, and certify 
with the state. Uh, these important points of the plan need to continue to be social distancing, st would still be in effect in, in these organizations of, of higher education. Um, masks will be worn when six feet social distancing is, is not possible. Uh, another big component the state is looking for is cleaning. Cleaning of desks, high touch surfaces uh, will have to be done uh, and, and that will also be included uh, in the safety plans. So we certainly wish uh, our higher education organizations uh, in the county best of, of luck and wishes uh, as they now have permission to open. Okay, um, media production. The important word here in this slide is production, is a key word. Uh, this does not include, uh, for example, theaters. Um, again, safety plans need to be made uh, and certified with the state. Uh, the safety plans really should not be sent uh, to Shenango County Health Department. That's not necessary. Uh, but you do need to submit your plan and, and certification to the state. Uh, you should also keep a copy uh, of that plan uh, at your business. Uh, and again, those plans need to include social distancing, use of masks, uh, and cleaning. Okay, low risk. Uh, outdoor arts and entertainment. Uh, these organizations, which you see here listed with the check marks, uh, are allowed to open uh, at 33% uh, of capacity. So they're really just been given permission to begin uh, to open. Again, safety plans. Distancing, masks, cleaning will be very important. Certify those plans uh, with the state. Okay, low risk indoor, indoor arts and entertainment. Again, look at the check marks uh, to see those organizations uh, which are allowed to open. Uh, these indoor uh, organizations are allowed to open at 25% capacity now. Uh, and again, their safety plans uh, should be submitted to the state and, and certified. And we wish uh, all of these uh, organizations in the last few slides, which are now uh, given permission to open, uh, the best of, best of luck and wishes. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Marcus. Um, there's a couple of questions um, if we want to just before we go on to the next part, uh, spot. Uh, both these schools considered a technical school. Um, do you have an answer on that, Marcus or Isaiah? I don't think it's considered a technical school insofar as higher education, I, if that's what the question is alluding to. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. I, I think that's what I've been told. Um, and then another question was, will community theater be part of phase four? Um, so, Isaiah, do you want to take that? I, I don't believe so. As I read the guidance that's been published so far, uh, performing arts are, the guidance and, and the opening of performing arts is still to come. Um, we hope soon, but still to come and not, not part of this opening phase. Okay. Um, and there, you know, there are some questions about what, you know, what next phases are. There, there is not technically a phase five. I know we're still waiting for certain businesses to be open and we're working hard to try to advocate for that. Um, so, you know, we'll do the best we can to try to share the information as soon as we have it. Um, so we're, we're waiting for executive orders and other information as other organizations and businesses begin to open. But um, we'll go ahead and continue with the presentation and we'll come back to questions that we might have missed. So talking about low risk indoor arts and entertainment, you see it with museums and Jessica, I threw up a picture up there for you. I don't know if you caught it. <laughs> and, um, the Acton Historical Society and North, uh, Northeast Classic Crime Museum, just some local museums that we have here. Um, but with that, I'd like to introduce Jessica Mopin. Again, she's the Executive Director of the Shenango County Historical Society and Museum. 
and she has been working very hard to keep them um, operating even in a social world even though they've been closed all this time um, again I've been very impressed with her social media presence and pulling things out of the archives there have been some cool photos and, and things that she's been sharing so um, Jessica I'd love for you to, to talk with everybody about what you've been doing and how what you're looking at as far as reopening the museum thanks so much Carrie well Thank you. I, um, it's nice to see everybody-ish. <laughs> um, I think we, I term this unusual time in history as the great pause and it helps with modifying our approach. It gives a more positive spin on things and um, really people say that we should make lemonade out of lemons and, and I like lemonade better than lemons anyway. So that's kind of what I've done in order to make the lemonade taste all that much sweeter is calling this whole thing, The Great Pause. So I've got a series of three slides here. We're gonna start out with uh, embracing The Great Pause. And our big priority as a, as a historical and cultural organization throughout this time has been to really stay connected and engaged both within our community and in the industry. And in order to achieve that, uh, we've worked with lots of different groups, uh, in particular, Commerce Shenango, the Interagency Council, and the Nonprofit Connections Roundtable. These are all relationships that we had before the Great Pause began, but we were really strategic in being, staying connected with those and other like in organizations so that we didn't really lose sight of our connectivity to the community. And uh, as far as our industry is concerned, there's a, a wide variety of organizations that help support cultural and historic organizations like ours. Uh, one of them in particular is called the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services of New York. That's a mouthful. <laughs> we call them DIPSME. And they had a series of really great mentoring opportunities throughout the time. And it was very helpful for me to be able to connect with other people in the archival world. There's also the Museum Association of New York. That's also known as a Manny. And then as far as being a nonprofit and best practices, we're members of the New York Council of Nonprofits. That's known as NICON. And then as an aside, just so that I could stay connected with other industry professionals, I also participated in some workshops with the Preservation League of New York State, as well as the Texas Historical Commission. And I think one of the, one of the best ways to stay on, on top of things and be productive through all this is to just be unabashedly opportunistic with whatever comes your way. And so when it was the Tex Texas Historical Commission probably sounds a little strange, but it's just another opportunity for us to stay connected and to hear about best practices in other places as well. And also to hear how they're planning to reopen. Another big challenge for us was to remain relevant uh, and to be aware and sensitive to what folks were, were you know, where folks were dealing with throughout all of this. And we're not an essential service. We're, um, we're, we're, we're a life, we, we give pride of place and we're a life-giving organization really in the fact that we celebrate all of our culture and heritage. So we had to make sure that we stayed true to our mission through all this and be able to share and communicate that in the best way possible. And we took as much advantage as we possibly could through all this, including really excited about our website relaunch which we did in the midst of the pandemic. That's www.shenangohistorical.org. Shameless plug. <laughs> and in addition to that, we also were part of virtual celebrations. In April, we piggybacked on the Smithsonian Has a Museum Day, the first Saturday of April. And they were not able to continue with that museum day. And really we weren't either in the way that we had planned to be, but we still continued on this year's uh, special theme was called Earth Optimism. And so we continue to post uh, opportunities on our Facebook page on April 4th, including videos and some trivia and some worksheets so that folks could still have a sense of celebrating Museum Day, even though we weren't all at the museum. And then as I mentioned, we did have our website relaunch. So early May, May 1st, we had a website launch party virtually that included a website scavenger hunt and uh, complete with digital door prizes. So that was lots of fun, or at least I thought it was fun. And this, uh, just a few weeks ago, we were also part of Path Through History, which usually happens during Father's Day weekend and uh, lots of historical and cultural organizations have different unique opportunities and exhibit openings. And so this year, instead of being present on the physical campus, we had a series of video presentations 
including North American Sites and Stories in Chenango County and a, a partner, partner video with the Farmers Museum, as well as a presentation by two of, um, two of our educators who actually had been social distancing um, socially together. So it was really nice for them to come in and do a presentation and it's had a lot of hits on Facebook. So we're really excited about that too. Speaking of Facebook, um, we've seen since March 13th, which is so strange, March 13th was our last day that the irony of March 13th being our last open day has not lost on me, but we've taken our Facebook, our Facebook game to a whole new level. We always try to take advantage of other typical hashtags like Museum Monday or Trivia Tuesday, Throwback Thursday, and Flashback Friday. But in this case, we jumped on some new industry trends that were, you know, the, as a result of the, the current public health crisis, such as hashtag museum from home, as well as hashtag museum bouquet, which was an opportunity for us to send a virtual bouquet to other cultural organizations. And um, there are some folks on the call today who were, they, they got bouquets from our museum virtually. <laughs> And, uh, and then we also were able to draw upon a really robust archival, um, we have a lot of videos, cassette videos that had kind of languished, I'll say, that we hadn't really pulled out and hadn't digitized. So we've been taking advantage of that and we've been using those videos for hashtag movie Monday and hashtag film Friday. So we're really, I'm really excited about the fact that throughout all this, beginning between now, from since now to March 13th, we've seen a 27% increase in followers on our Facebook page. So it's been, that's been really helpful to be able to elevate our social media profile. And then one other thing that we did as far as thinking outside the box is we did have a radio broadcast that was um, done with This Week in Central New York. And it was, uh, snippets have been heard uh, several times throughout, the, throughout this, um, throughout our closing. So that's been great too. And uh, one more thing that we did, another aspect of remaining relevant were our, our collaborations that we continue to work. You know, we, we try to stay in connection with all of our, our usual, our normal partners. So 4-H, shout out to 4-H. They did a great job helping us with um, our virtual Museum Day celebration. And we are part of Dairy Day. And of course, Dairy Day didn't happen, but we were able to collaborate with the Farmers Museum. They were going to be present at Dairy Day. And so we hosted, um, on behalf of Dairy Day, we hosted the Farmers Museum video during our Path Through History virtual celebration. And then as far as offline or not virtual, um, also keeping in touch with the Shenango County Bar Association. We're working on a legal history of, of the county with them. And uh, also we're staying connected with the Tri-County uh, chapter of Women's Incorporated. So they're doing their best as, a, as an organization to remain relevant and connected and we're trying to help them along with that too. So our next slide is managing the great pause. And of course, it's all well and good, but finances are the bottom line. So I wanted to just speak briefly about um, the SBA PPP loan application. Um, it did uh, wait a little bit just to see how that was all gonna shake out and our initial uh, approach to a lender, we, we got closed out. So we went with another lender that serendipitously we just happened to have an account with and the process was reasonably seamless. Um, it's a little uh, unnerving to sort of anticipate where you might be uh, financially and how things are gonna shake out, but we were successful and we received a grant or well, it's a loan, sorry, it's a loan. And we're, we're grateful, very, very grateful for that. It's definitely helped. So our organization, unlike many other cultural and um, historical organizations, does not rely on admissions or ticket sales based in order to maintain our, our operations. And so therefore it, it hasn't necessarily been um, as challenging for us as other organizations to keep things running and we're, we are aware of that. We're just doing our very best. So um, the SBA and the PPP loan has helped pull us through where we might not have had some, you know, in general unexpected at the door admissions. So that's, that's been very helpful. And grants, I love to call grants the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> and as far as other funding opportunities go, we did take advantage of hashtag giving Tuesday now 
and we don't typically do a, a spring campaign, but we did jump on this opportunity and we, we raised over $500, which we wouldn't normally have seen from private individual donations. And that happened earlier this spring and we're super excited about, you know, being able to appeal to the community and, and, and have that support. So, and we also received a grant through Humanities New York and uh, so that's another great opportunity that's going to help sustain us through all this as well. So that's the good. The bad is that there was a grant through another organization that was um, pretty complicated and but I felt kind of comp I, I felt confident enough nobody goes in there working on grant applications thinking they're not going to get them and uh, it was a little bit of we didn't we didn't receive that grant and then the ugly there was another grant opportunity uh, federally based that was going to be 45 hours worth of uh, work. And uh, I, I found out later that it was only 14% success rate. So I'm really glad that I didn't take that time to apply for that grant. So there's that's another, that's another factor that goes into finances and managing a small organization like the museum. So the big picture of operations with the mindset of being in the great pause, we've you know been able to to uh, do some assessment and reevaluate how we manage our operations and how can we deliver our mission and serve our members and the community to the fullest, uh, to our fullest potential with the greatest return on investment in the most efficient way possible. So we worked with uh, Nikon attorneys and their legal department to review our bylaws just to ensure that we're compliant with uh, New York State nonprofit laws and they've been really helpful. Um, unfortunately, our document went from like four or five pages long to over almost 20, but that's good because now we're more in compliance, which is what we all want to be. And, uh, and also we finished up, uh, we'd started the process of working on our strategic planning uh, with Nikon as well as with Dipsney. And the great news is that has been passed. Our board approved that just, it was just our last board meeting on Tuesday, uh, last week. And so now our strategic plan through 2024 is complete. So there's a taking the great pause and making the best of what we could to assess how we're doing operations. With that comes uh, alternatives to how we manage our operations. And that, included, that includes managing some internships that we're doing. We have a Colgate University Upstate Institute Fellowship that was uh, fortunately was uh, offered to us through a, another application process early in the spring. But of course, uh, both Colgate and, uh, and the museum, we, we don't want to risk anyone, you know, anyone coming in contact. We want to maintain social distancing. So that fellowship has moved online and we're in the midst of that. We will see how successful we are when it's all over, but we're staying connected with that student. And he's, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, excuse me, he's a historian from his uh, native country of China. And so he's really embracing all that he can learn about American history, as well as the project we have him working on. So that's very exciting. And then speaking of exciting news, because of our reassessment and looking at alternatives, we do have some opportunities that we've identified that will be, you'll be hearing about in the new near future, just to help us uh, be a little bit more strategic and, um, and better serve our community, really be the best, uh, be the best county historical society museum we possibly can be. And now we're on to ending the great pause when it shall end we're not sure but we're working on that as well so as far as reopening is concerned there have been you know internally uh myself and our other staff person our part-time bookkeeper we've been alternating days when we're in the museum and also we've had some board members some executive committee members who've uh, taken different various days we've staggered our schedules so that we could make sure that we're being safe, checking the mail, checking to make sure that the museum and the property and the campus are all secure. And we've been slowly, for the last couple of weeks, there have been one or two of us on, on, in the offices working just so we can communicate better uh, as far as being in the same place at the same time and, uh, and just taking care of paperwork and, and whatnot. And that will continue, but it will, it will, all, it will also be slow and steady. As far as our external uh, opening, re reopening to the public, it's to be determined really. Our board uh, determined a few weeks ago during our board meeting that we're going to take a, a, we're gonna be cautious and slow and steady. And that's mostly because our audience population, the visitors and the volunteers that we serve, the vast majority of them fall within 
the um, the population of most vulnerable for um, having complications with the virus. And therefore, we're just the pause is extending for us. We are taking our time and really evaluating how we're approaching this. So I think the key here is flexibility. Um, every cultural and historical organization is different. Everybody's going to have a different plan. It really is, however, it works best for your organization. And of course, uh, as we just heard earlier from Marcus, we can only open at 25% when we do. And that's going to affect how we have the traffic flow and whatnot. So it's we're being, being cautiously prudent and optimistic is our best approach at this point. And then I put this, this uh, little sign out there that says, I'm a proud, attractive nuisance. And that's a, that's a attractive nuisance is kind of a, a museum industry. The, it's a, become a, a soundbite for all of us. And we're proud to be an attractive nuisance, but we are also recognizing that we're attractive and bright and shiny, but we're also, we could be a nuisance if we're not careful with making sure that we follow safety protocols. So that's why it's so important that we maintain a sense of sensibility of being careful and making sure that we're opening and, and following protocols that make sense for our communities. Because of course, everyone's health and well-being is a top priority for us. And uh, when we do reopen to the public, it will be, we've been, I've been following the New York State's reopening summary guidelines from the moment they were posted and I've been taking things off and we will have stanchions and um, arrows on the floor and on the walls and plexiglass dividers and all of the important, of course, uh, hand sanitizer on every, uh, on every window still and, uh, and masks for all of our volunteers and our, and our staff too. So I think as far as, you know, our approach, it's about managing expectations. You know, some museums I know are going to open just as soon as they possibly can. They've been chomping at the bit. And I know some museums are closed entirely for the rest of the 2020 season. And I know other museums are planning to open in September or October. So we just have to manage expectations and remember that, you know, our, our volunteers in our community and the folks that we serve they have expectations and we just have to be sure to be kind. So kindness is key. That's been my whole thing throughout this is that everybody has expectations, but we can just kindly and calmly assert the fact that we want to make sure that health and well-being is our top priority for our folks that we serve. So that's my story. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jessica. And I, I just, you know, I'd like to commend you not only for doing such a great job, but keeping a positive spirit. I know that you You've attended, I think, every webinar we've done in the last three months, whether it was relevant to you or not. And I just, you know, I know that there are a lot of businesses like you that have this great spirit who are just going with the flow and doing what they can. And so I, I appreciate how, you know, positive you are and forward thinking and that you're doing the best thing for our community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so moving on, there are uh, some other things that have happened in the last week or two. Uh, lots of questions regarding some of the other things that have been open regarding um, outdoor rec and sports and youth sports and restrictions on social gatherings. So um, I have uh, Isaiah is going to jump back on and he's going to go through with us. Some of the hot topics lately have been <clears throat> around sports and rec. Um, so Isaiah is going to walk through some of that with you. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Um... I think everybody's excited. I know uh, I've been fielding calls for a number of weeks about uh, youth sports and organized activities. And so that's always good when we tell folks, okay, yeah, we can go ahead and do this now. Um, there's a list here that uh, Carrie's provided of kind of low risk uh, sports that have been open for since 618. This list uh, continues to grow. So anybody who doesn't see their sport on the list I recommend you uh, check out the link there, the in Empire State Development Guidance. Uh, I think it's in section 13 of that guidance. Um, they keep adding to this list. I know I'm excited to get out and do some zip lining uh, the next chance I get. But uh, what it really, what you can see here is non-touch, low risk sports are what's in that kind of essential activity list from ESD. Um, now we move on to other sports. Uh, the state has nicely broke down the sports by risk, uh, moderate, lower, and higher risk sports. As we look at uh, moderate risk sports and lower risk sports, these are sports that have a limited amount of interpersonal contact, uh, limited amount of shared equipment, 
big open spaces. So uh, you can go through the list here. Uh, baseball, uh, little league, softball, those would fall in here. Uh, I don't think we have a local local water polo team, uh, but if we did, we could um, we could get them back in the water. So what these groups are uh, okay to do is pretty much all of their activities. The low and moderate risk groups uh, can do practice, play games. You can't do competitive tournaments. They don't want you bringing multiple teams together. They don't want to see you traveling uh, inner region to do matches, scrimmages. Uh, kind of you stay home, play games around your, uh, within your own community. Uh, the high risk sports, football, wrestling, ice hockey, you know, you're in each other's face the whole time. Social distancing is uh, impossible. Um, a lot of shared equipment, a lot of close contact. Uh, at this time, really, we can't have competitive team practices, games, meets, or competitive tournaments. Uh, they ask that these sports be limited to drills, non-contact, social distance, um, or low contact drills. So football, you, you can punt, pass, and kick, but we probably ought to stay out of the trenches uh, and uh, do not do as much hitting or face-to-face -face hitting. So the, the, the state has produced a pretty detailed guidance on this. I'd recommend folks uh, check that out on the state's website. It does go through, you know, there's some specific guidance for specific sports. As you get in there, I know a lot of the youth sports organizations are producing guidances of their own that incorporate, excuse me, incorporate these. Uh, so I recommend if you're operating a uh, youth sports league, make sure you're following those instructions. They really put out the best practices and are, are more detailed than the state's guidance, which are pretty general. Uh, in general, for youth sports and sport leagues, um, any employees of a sport outlet or coaches, official members of the organization uh, need to be screened and logged every day. The guidance stops short of mandating screening for all players and participants, but if you can do it without any pushback, it's recommended. Obviously, youth sports, you're going to know who's on the team. You're going to have the roster. Uh, what this guidance goes on to say that if someone should test positive, uh, in the sport or at one of the games. Uh, I know it's going to help our job here at the health department doing contact tracing if you have a list of everyone who was there, uh, opposed to trying to guess that list or recreate that list um, days or weeks after the event. So tracking who's around is really going to be a big help to us if hopefully we don't have to go through that, but if we have to do contact tracing, um, we'll need to know that. As far as the sport itself go, and I'll use, uh, I'll use Little League because I feel the most questions on this. Um, whenever, whenever social distancing can't be achieved, masks have to be worn. Coaches, all the time. Um, players, they kind of say if it doesn't prohibit, in, if it doesn't prohibit the activity. So if you think your team can wear masks while they're standing at first, maybe they need, maybe they should. I don't, you know, I, I don't coach little league, so I don't know how uh, prohibitive that would be. The guidance just says, if you can wear a mask in those situations, please do. If you can't, um, you know, then you don't have to. They do record, or they do require that a hand wash or hand sanitizer be available for each team. You know, when the kids come in off the field, they've got to sanitize their hands, wash their hands. Um, if, especially the kids who catch the ball, handle the ball, handle the bat. You know, any shared equipment has to be disinfected between uses. So you'll need a way to disinfect bats between batters if they're sharing equipment. Uh, pretty common sense stuff that's been, you know, the best practices all the way along that they've just applied those now to sports outlets. If anyone, if anybody's operating a youth sports league and has specific questions, um, feel free to contact me. We can go through it together. As with every other industry, uh, sports are also asked to complete a safety plan template, have that plan on hand, and uh, affirm that you've reviewed the guidelines on the state New York Forward website. I think Carrie's got here at the bottom of the slide the link to where that uh, the master guideline is. It's a decent guideline. It's pretty easy to follow. So I recommend anybody uh, who's managing youth sports or if you have children who are in youth sports to uh, go ahead and take a look at that and make sure we're keeping everybody safe. Isaiah, is there anything in the guidance that you've seen specific to umpires? 
umpire guidance? No, uh, umpires would be an employee of the sport. So they have to log in, pre-screen. They recommend that they pre-screen uh, before they come, right? The umpire should, before he gets in his car, should screen, oh, I don't have a fever. I haven't been exposed, uh, taking my temperature. And if, obviously, if they do, then they don't go, don't go to the game, right? Canceling the game is way better than uh, showing up there with a fever and a cough. Right. Uh, but they would be an employee. They, you know, if they can't achieve six foot distance, um, which some umpires can, standing, you know, maybe standing behind second, you can't achieve six foot separation. Maybe standing behind the catcher, you can't. In which case, you'd have to wear a mask. Okay. Um, and before we go on, just there's one other question. Uh, it's off the youth sports topic. So if you still have questions, please use the chat. Uh, window. We'll get to them as we can. Uh, there was a question about having an outdoor band uh, at a bar. Or at a, um, do you want to handle that? Yep. Uh, this, the guidance allows for live music at food service establishments. Um, it, the, nowhere in the guidance does it prohibit that activity. How the crowd is managed still has to follow all of those other guidelines. Social distancing, masks when not at tables, uh, all the other best practices that food service establishments have had to uh, abide by, they just can do it with, with a band in the corner. The band itself, I think they're treating a little more like a table. They're their own entity. So they're a little like if the band's less than six feet and doesn't want to wear a mask, they're a group, right? They've made that choice on their own. Um, if I, my band, we probably would stay away from each other. <laughs> uh, Wait, you're in a band? We need to back up. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's another webinar. <laughs> glory days. <laughs> um, thank you. And yeah, and just making sure again that you're following your occupancy. You know, I think whether you're inside or outside, right, there's occupancy restrictions related I see, to that. There's a question about dance students. Uh, dance, the guidance says that you do, it's not mandatory that participants, um, the kids get their temperatures taken. Having said that, it's, it's encouraged. I think there's, we can't mandate medical um, interventions in that setting. I think it's probably why this guidance came out the way it did. Um, so taking their temperature, I believe would be a best practice, but not a mandate. Okay, thank you. All right, we're gonna move on and we'll come back to some more questions. So please continue to send them in. Thank you very much, Isaiah. You're welcome. Uh, just another couple of quick updates from uh, the governor's update yesterday. The social and group gathering number limit was raised from 25 to 50. That's effective tomorrow with phase four. Also, indoor religious gatherings, their occupancy limit is going from 25 to 33%. Also, that's a phase four change. Um, I know we noted this earlier about you know bowling alleys, fitness facilities, movie theaters, malls. We still do not have clarification on that. Um, you know, just a reminder that, you know, myself, everyone at, at Chenango County, we're, we're all working together to try to do this. I know that it's voiced every day in the control room. We're talking about it. We're helping advocate. So, you know, we're trying to get some, some traction on this and get some guidance. Um, we're being told that the governor and his, his advisors feel like these are very, very high risk areas and they want to make sure that the guidance is right. Um, and they're looking at what's happening in other states. Uh, whether you agree with that or not, that's sort of where we're at. Um, you know, we're doing our best to try to get the voices of our businesses heard to know that we want to get these things open back up again. Um, so, you know, like, like it goes back to what Jessica said, right? Doing it the right way, doing it the smart way, understanding that this is the world that we're in right now. And we're doing our best to, to make those accommodations. But, um, you know, just know that we are working for you and we're trying to, trying to do this. Um, when you're reopening your business, uh, I know uh, both Marcus and Isaiah have alluded to this already. Um, when you go to the forward.ny.gov site, every phase and each of the state line guidelines, they all have their own box, their own section. So whether your business was in phase one, two, three, or tomorrow four, or if it's a statewide guidance, so something like sports, dentistry, um, religious services, those are going to be found under the statewide guidelines. They're not specific to a phase. It's more of a statewide change. Every section has view summary guidelines. The boxes just look just like this. View summary guidelines, you have to read them. Read and affirm detailed guidelines. You go through that, you read all the guidelines. At the end, there's a link. It takes you to a secondary portal where you can affirm 
that you understand the guidelines, you're gonna do what it says you have to do, and then print safety plan template. Again, that's available for every industry that's open, and, and that is a requirement to be uh, open, operational, to have your team start you know, playing when they get to that point. Um, all that is found. And if you would like a step-by-step -step process, we did record a video, it's on our YouTube channel. It's about a 10 minute video and it walks you through the entire certification process. So I take you through it, like I'm certifying Commerce Shenango, um, but it's, the video is there if you'd like a step-by-step -step guide. Uh, Marcus, I'm gonna have you come back on and talk just briefly. I know we go through this every time, but it seems like there's always a lot of questions surrounding enforcement and regulations. Do you wanna just talk briefly about this? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Um, complaints, uh, whether, uh, well, let me define a complaint. A complaint, it would be someone that comes into your business and feels that social distancing or masks or some other safety item is, is not being adhered to. They're uncomfortable, they think you're violating, the guidance, uh, they will either call the Shenango County Health Department and make a complaint or they will uh, register that complaint uh, through the state. Uh, you see that number in the, in the middle of the slide there. Uh, so either way, whether the complainant calls the health department or the state, it'll come back to the Shenango County Health Department. And I wanted to let everyone know uh, Isaiah and, and my philosophy is that this past three months has been very stressful for all of us. It's been long, it's been difficult, and I really want to take the approach of partnering uh, with all of you uh, to get your businesses up and running and to be successful and to be safe related to COVID-19. So. If, a, if I do receive a complaint, uh, what will happen is uh, you'll receive a call from us here at the health department. We'll discuss the complaint, um, make changes to your safety plan, and implement them. And hopefully that will, will take care of it. Um, enforcement, I'm only really interested I'm never interested in doing enforcement, but I'm, I'll have to pursue enforcement only if businesses just won't work with us at the health department at all. Um, so I want to partner with you. We want to make things safe. I'm not focused on punitive measures at all. Uh, just want to work with all of you to make sure we can all go forward as a community uh, safely. That's really uh, the philosophy here at the health department. Isaiah, would you have anything to add to that? No, Mark, you know, we, can sit, we continue to receive complaints every day um, and there are varying degrees. None of them have been a significant non-compliance. You know, every one has been kind of minor and we've been able to uh, tackle it relatively easily working with the business in question. So, and I really want to uh, give a big thumbs up to all our community partners, all the businesses out there are really doing an excellent job. Um, yeah, there's a couple rogue operators, but there always is, right? Uh, but in general, everyone's doing an awesome job and you're all to be commended for that. Absolutely, thank you all. Thank you, and thank you. And everybody at your department, Marcus, you've all been wonderful to work with and I appreciate the collaboration between everybody and. We've been, I think, you know, handling it and helping answer people's questions and, and it's been a great collaboration, so thank you. Um, you know, on that, on that note with just trying to stay positive, I, you know, we, we try to always share positivity here. You know, Jessica was a great <laughs> segue to this. Uh, we have a number of these uh, memes on our Facebook page. We have a photo gallery um, of these and we're, you know, just trying to share the message of being kind and considerate to one another, understanding that what we're going through right now is difficult for everybody, whether you're a consumer, a business owner, somebody just in the community, you're working with one of these agencies, you know, no matter where you're sitting, it's been a really difficult time for everybody and you never know what somebody else is dealing with. So, you know, we just like to encourage people to please just continue being considerate and kind to one another, do the right thing, you know, wear the mask, if you've got to wear the mask, don't make a business owner have to say something to you. You know, it's just, there's, there's a lot of ways that you can just be kind to one another. And so I think that's, that's 
that's the point of this. Um, Matt Beckwith is very kind. <laughs> Good segue to Matt. Uh, we have Matt Beckwith uh, with us and he is going to talk. There were some questions about PPE um, and hand sanitizer. And as you can see, we've, we've given, he's given out a number of supplies. But Matt, do you want to give an update on this? Sure. So um, as of the 24th, we've given out uh, over 1,500 gallons of hand sanitizer, uh, over 61,000 surgical masks, over 31,000 cloth masks, well over 8,000 face shields, N95 masks, and isolation gowns, and some other isolated other things such as test kits uh, that we received from the state. Um, we have received notification while we, the pandemic, were able to order a lot of these supplies from the state. Uh, they were being regulated by the executive chamber. We have received notification that uh, we will not be receiving regular shipments of cloth masks, surgical masks, face shields, or anything like that uh, from this point forward. Um, although we did get notified today, uh, excuse me, yesterday, uh, that we were we were to receive unexpectedly some more cloth masks uh, to be distributed. And as a matter of fact, in timing for a lot of the youth sports, the New York Yankees and the New York Mets have both donated uh, a rather large quantity of cloth masks for the young players and youth sports. So we're expecting to get those today. And then I've already talked with some of the sport organizations for baseball and softball, Little League, and we're going to be handing those out uh, to those associations uh, within the next day or so. The thing that we can get, still get uh, quite a bit of is um, hand sanitizer. Um, I do have some of that left um, and they're telling us that we can continue ordering. So that is my plan. And, um, you know, I do have some cloth masks that are left. Um, so if anybody does need some, they can reach out to me and, and get to either some cloth masks or hand sanitizer. Um, this is a side note for the health issues going on. Uh, at the YMCA for the last couple months. Uh, we've been distributing a lot of our stuff there and the cloth masks and hand sanitizer have been going out uh, quite regularly. So um, those are pretty impressive numbers, uh, to be honest with you. If you think of the population base of this county is about 48,000, uh, just in surgical masks, uh, cloth masks, we've handed over all 92,000, almost 93,000 masks. So. Um, Somebody asked us on a webinar earlier uh, what our opinion was if people were wearing masks and, and things and, and on a regular basis. You can see people that are wearing them. Um, like Isaiah and Marcus have both said, we do still get some complaints um, for people that are not wearing them. Um, they graciously take care of it. Um, we just encourage people that, you know, there is still a requirement to wear masks. And uh, we encourage people to do that. It's for not only your protection, but the protection of the people that are around you. Um, and if you are gonna wear a mask, uh, we ask you to wear it correctly, which means that it covers your nose and on the lower part of your chin. The mask doesn't do any good if it's sitting underneath your chin and exposing your mouth and your nose, or the top part of the mask is just sitting under your nose and your nose is exposed. So, um, it's hot. Uh, we had the Board of Elections here doing elections on Tuesday. We spent most of the day outside. I know uh, we had to wear a mask and uh, it's hot, it's sweaty. Um, but, you know, the good thing about those cloth masks is they can be reused. They can be washed and, and dried. And, and I wouldn't recommend drying them in a dryer only because they'll shrink. Um, but uh, you can you know, air dry them and reuse them over again. So we, we have, we're supposed to be getting an abundance more of cloth masks today, along with the masks for the youth sports. Uh, that, like I said, that we're gonna be handing out. So if any of the businesses do need more hand sanitizer, we can provide that to them and uh, the cloth masks for as long as they, as long as we have them. Um, but at this point in time, uh, we've been told that our requests for additional masks and other PPE uh, will be denied. And, um, but as we continue to roll through this, 
Uh, I'm sure at some point we may or may not end up getting some more. Uh, and if we do, we'll certainly make that available. All right. Thank you very much, Matt, and to everybody uh, on your team for doing this and for arranging for the distributions and being on top of this. And on top of everything else you're doing, this is a, a big undertaking. So thank you very much. Thank you, and Matt's information is there. And the last slide has contact information for his office as well, if you want to get in touch with him. Uh, so we, uh, we, let me just see if there's any other questions. Um, so regarding gyms and fitness centers and movie theaters, you know, as, as I said earlier, there, there is no movement on that yet. It's, it comes up every single day um, in, the, in the control room for the Southern Tier. Uh, we're being told that, that there are guidelines that the state is working on, but they keep being refined and changed. They're, they're taking a look at uh, what's happening in other states. They're trying to make sure that they're thinking of everything possible. Um, there's some concern that by opening up some of these these uh, different sectors and businesses that it's it's going to there, it's going to be hard to control and we're going to have a spike. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of push. I know there's a lot of um, different organizations kind of you know hitting up the government right now, asking them uh, about this and trying to get it open. I know we talked about it a couple weeks ago. We had uh, my home gym on and they were talking about the. The issues that they've had in other YMCA. Um, there's a you know, couple establishments here in Norwich. So, um, you know, do, we're doing the best we can to advocate for you and for those facilities. And, and as soon as we hear anything about it, I will, you know, we will let those people know. Um, I know who you are, <laughs> who wants information. And so as soon as I, I get any of that, I will definitely get back out to you. Um, I think everything else that's been asked has been addressed. So um, we're just going to move on. If just we still have a few more minutes. We'll have just a couple more slides. If you still have questions, please put them in the chat window. Thank you, Isaiah, for managing most of these for me. I appreciate it. Uh, just an update on our Fueling the Frontline initiative. You know, we've been doing this for a couple of months now. Um, we are very close to our goal of $10,000 raised for this program. We have given out over 530 meals in the Shenango County area using 27 local restaurants. Um, if you would like to make a donation, um, you can go to our GoFundMe page or you can send a donation right here to the Shenango Foundation. Um, big thank you to Mary Miner who has coordinated this entire project. She's done a great job. Um, and to all of our businesses and restaurants who have uh, given donated product and, you know, we try to pay them and they don't want money or they want all the money. So it's been, it's been a really wonderful collaboration and we still are moving forward with this. So thank you very much. I uh, have to give you a big plug for Commerce Shenango. Uh, so right now we are doing a membership drive. Uh, so if you join, if you have not previously been a member of Commerce Shenango and you join before the end of July, you will get 50% off of your annual dues for 2020. Normally when somebody joins the chamber, you pay full price for the first however long it is and the second year is prorated. But understanding what people are going through right now with finances, we wanted to give you a little bit of a break and give you an opportunity to join us. Uh, we have a lot of great things planned for quarter three and quarter four. We, uh, Mary Miner um, is our new director of membership and program. She's not so new anymore, but she's been with us since February. And then everything got shut down. So you probably haven't had a chance to meet her. So there she is. If you're not sure what she looks like. Um, we've been working really hard on our programming for the fall. And we have some great ideas about how to do some small events, some hybrid events. Uh, we're going to do our 5K. So, you know, there's a lot of great things happening uh, coming up and you don't want to miss it. So uh, please think about joining Commerce Shenango and you can contact Mary if you'd like more information. And thank you very much. That is everybody's contact information. Um, and please be sure to check the, the Zoom chat for some great information. Um, there is a drive through rabies clinic at the Shenango County Fairgrounds coming up on July 18th. Uh, thank you, Isaiah, for posting that information. Um, we'll grab that information, Megan, if you can grab that link, we'll include it in the slides that we send out. Um, so either later tonight or first thing tomorrow, we will send you out all of the slides from today, and we'll also include our link to our YouTube channel for this. So if you have any additional questions, please let our office know. You can get a hold of us, contact me, contact anyone here, contact any of the people you see listed. Thank you again to all of our speakers and a big thank you to Jessica Moquin uh, for being our guest speaker today. Uh, have a great day and be well, Shenango.